It was about this time last year that the papers were headlining the disappearance of seven-year-old Mark Tilsley from Wokingham. Despite a huge police inquiry, there's still no trace of Mark. It's a long shot, perhaps, hoping for new witnesses a year on. After all, hundreds of people have already tried to help. But Thames Valley Police have asked us to use the anniversary, which was two weeks ago now, to film a reconstruction and see if we could still jog a memory and provide a new and vital clue. Mark's home is in Wokingham, 10 miles from Reading in Berkshire. The fair was back in Wokingham this weekend, on the same ground at Wellington Road, where it's been each May or June for 50 years. Mark's home, too, was in the centre of Wokingham. The fair was a five-minute bike ride away. It's 50 miles away on Friday, the 1st of June last year, at 7.20 in the morning. A lorry stops for a hitchhiker on the A30. Going to Wokingham? Yeah. The driver, Shane Northway, picked up his passenger 20 miles east of Salisbury, just outside Stockbridge. He remembers the man well. He had a bit, there was a little bit of odour there, and you could see him been sleeping rough. He had, there was dirt all around the collar of his shirt. His mac was really filthy on the inside, red lining. Where you going, mate? I'm making my way around the country looking for work. He was in the cab with me for about two and three quarter hours, and I eventually dropped him off just past the fairground in Wokenham. Yeah, you can drop me off here, mate, if you like. It, do well, I'll just pull down the road out of the way of the traffic. All right. When the man got out, he headed back up Wellington Road towards the fairground. It was a busy time on the main road, and someone must have seen him. Bye bye, Mark. See you later. Mark's mother left home at 5.15 that evening to go to work. She hasn't seen Mark since. Bye. Mark left the house half an hour later, telling his father he was going to the fair. He was a quiet, shy boy, often to be seen on his bike in the town centre. The tiger jacket he wore that day was eye-catching and distinctive. Eyewitness accounts confirm that Mark was at the fair by 6.30 that evening. Two witnesses recall that a man appeared to be watching Mark. Police are also certain that an hour and a quarter later, Mark was still at the fair, now on the Dodgems. It's possible that the man who was with him was the same man who earlier had been watching him. He was about six feet tall, with scruffy hair, very similar to the man dropped off earlier in the day by the lorry driver. Except this man had glasses. About 8 p.m., Mark leaves the fairground with the same man. Though he left his bike behind, Mark appears to have left the fair quite willingly. Correct for two points. Challenge or tell me yourself. It was this man, David Hine, who may have been the last person to see Mark Tildesley that Friday evening. If it was Mark, he was in Langborough Road, apparently with the same man he'd been with at the fair. Mark has never been seen again. His mother still refuses to believe the worst. I still say someone's got him and he's let, they're living rough or something because it's a mother's instinct. I know he's all right. Well, we still hope so. Detective Superintendent Tony Miller is now in charge of this investigation. Now, how likely is it that the hitchhiker, the man there at the fair, and the man we've just seen in Langborough Road are one and the same man, in fact? 
quite frankly, we can't say positively. What I can say is I'm fairly sure that the man seen at the fair and the man in Langborough Road are one and the same. You will recall the description given of the man who had the lift by the lorry driver. It's not dissimilar to the man at the fairground. In fact, he was about 45 to 60 years of age. He had grey hair, browning, and indeed he was described as having a long nose. This was a feature about him, and also a beard growth which indeed matched the man who was given the lift. Now, the man seen at the fair had spectacles on. So if we look at our video fit, we can see what he might look like with glasses on. Right. Now, the hitchhiker in the lorry wasn't wearing any glasses, was he? Indeed he wasn't, and indeed the man in Langborough Road wasn't. But other than that, the descriptions are very, very similar. So what you want to do is for the man who was hitchhiking that ride in the lorry that day to at least come forward so that you can eliminate him? Indeed we would, yes. Well, if we can recap on his movements that day, the lorry driver picked up the hitchhiker on Friday the 1st of June, and that was just west of Stockbridge, and at 7.20 in the morning. They then travelled up the A30 and along the M3 and reached Wokingham at about 10 to 10 again that morning, and the driver dropped him off in Wellington Road near to the fair. Now, do we know where he went after that? We don't, but perhaps we could start by going back to the commencement of that journey, and you will recall that he had a tachograph in his hand. We can see it there. And as the viewers can see. The reason I take you back there is because, indeed, this man may have been a lorry driver. If he was, uh, other persons may have given him a lift from Wokingham. If, in fact, they did, we'd like them to come forward. We should say that anybody who hitches the lift with one of the tachograph is saying to a lorry driver that, that he's another lorry driver. Indeed, that gives the indication, yes. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there was a conversation by this man with the lorry driver to the effect he was looking for casual labour fruit picking. I'd like to hear from anyone who gave employment of that nature to a man of that description. So somebody might remember picking up somebody with a tachograph because that was quite distinctive. Indeed, they might. Uh, as we've emphasised, we, if nothing else, we want to eliminate this man from the inquiry. Right. Now, you've traced so far about 400 people who were actually at the fair on that day. How many more people do you think you need to see? How many more people were there? I can't answer how many people were there, but what I can say is I want to speak to every person who went at the fair that evening. Indeed, uh, let us be the judge of what they saw uh, as to whether it's of evidential value. Please come forward and contact us. And just once again, we've seen the jacket in the film. Let's have one more look at it. You brought it, a facsimile of the jacket in with the tiger motif. Indeed. That's uh, the jacket, or very similar to the jacket that uh, Mark was wearing. And that might indeed attract the attention of persons that night. Right. So to sum up, you need to find the hitchhiker on that day, the one who hitched a ride in the lorry, anybody else who was at the fair that day to come forward who hasn't come forward already, and the man in Langborough Road who was seen in Langborough Road towards the evening. Indeed we would. In addition to that, I would also like to say, as a parent, as I'm sure many of the viewers are parents, we can only imagine the anguish this family have faced over the last 12 months. We will pursue the inquiry relentlessly. Please, if anyone has any information additional to what we've asked for, please come forward and contact us. Thank you very much indeed. And if you think you know anything that might help us to find Mark, here's the number again, 01 811 Or you can ring Thames Valley Police at Reading on 0734 585 one. That's 0734, the code for Reading, 585 one. Last September, four missing children dominated the headlines. One of them was Leonie Keating, and you may remember we featured the hunt for her killer on our October programme. The bodies of Leonie and two other children were found soon after they went missing and arrests were made. But there was no trace of the fourth child, six-year-old Barry Lewis from South London. His whereabouts remained a mystery for three months until December when his body was discovered in a field in Essex. Tonight, police are disclosing new evidence about the case in the hope that you might help catch Barry's killer. Our reconstruction begins in London at the market close to where he lived. Sunday morning, 15th of September, at East Street Market in Walworth. The stalls were busy with shoppers as usual. Just 200 yards away from the end of the market, at the junction with Dawes Street, Barry was staying temporarily at the house of friends, the Leightons, while his mother was waiting for rehousing by the council. British diplomats in Moscow that day, Barry had lunch at the house with Denise Leighton and her children before going out to play with seven-year-old Jackie. Yeah. Where are we going? We're going to... Out in front. All right, then. Ta-da. Bye. Bye. Ah! 
Barry and Jackie went down East Street to Trafalgar House in Bronte Close to play with their friend Michelle. <laughs> Michelle's mother, Mrs Ford, kept an eye on them as they played outside the flats. Then Michelle and Barry went up to the flat, leaving Jackie playing downstairs. decided to go home and Jackie went with him to the corner of Bronte Close. All right, I'll see you later. I'm going home now. Bye. Barry walked on down Blackwood Street towards East Street. What happened next is a mystery. By four o'clock on East Street, the market was gone, and Barry, too, had completely vanished. For three months, nothing was heard of him. Then, in December, his body was found in a field 25 miles away. 16th of September, the day after Barry disappeared. On the road known as the Crooked Mile, just outside Waltham Abbey in Essex, a man had run out of petrol. He left his car at the entrance to Travers Piggery. Police have now been able to establish that the boy he was carrying was almost certainly Barry Lewis. He seemed sleepy and listless, but he was alive. The nearest garage, Abbey Petrol Station, was three miles down the road. What's the can take? About two pounds, sir. Right, my favourite now. Thank you. Do I got a petrol? Yeah, up for a good mile. Can you give this man in the Charles lift back to his car at the Crooked Mile? I'm sorry, I'm going the other way, Chingford. There should be somebody who'll take you. It's OK. I'll get there. The man walked a few hundred yards up the Crooked Mile and stood hitchhiking at a junction opposite Lee Valley Nurseries. Seeing the boy and the petrol can, a local man on his way home stopped to help. Can I give you a lift? Yeah, please. Where's your car? It's in the entrance to a farm, just up the road on the right. Wouldn't it be better to put the child on the back seat? No. Nah. He'll be all right here. The child OK? He's a bit of poorly. He didn't sleep well last night. The driver noticed that the man seemed edgy and reluctant to talk. He drove him up the road past the pink house at Clapgate Lane. Here it is. Over there. The driver took them back to Travers Piggery. He remembers that the man's car was a red hatchback similar to a Talbot Horizon. It was in a tatty condition. Well, Barry's body was found just a mile away three months later. 
Superintendent Hatful is leading the hunt for his killer. Perhaps you could take us through on the map where the man and boy went that day on the 16th of September. Yes, the, the garage is in the centre of Wolverham Abbey and is approximately three miles away from where the, the red car was parked and about a mile and a half away from where the boy's body was eventually found. Which was near the pink house in Clapgate Lane? Yes, on the bridle path. Past. Right. The car seemed fairly distinctive. Do you think he might be still driving that car? The There's a hatchback? possibility he may still have it. It was a red hatchback car, most probably a Talbot Horizon, described as about five to seven years of age and in a fairly tatty condition. Now, we saw the man on the film leave the car, and then the next we saw if he was walking into Abbey petrol station. Somebody surely must have seen him on that three-mile route carrying the boy. He must have looked quite conspicuous. Do you think he walked all the way carrying the boy anyway? No, not only do I believe that somebody saw him, I'm positive somebody picked them up and gave them a lift. I desperately want to trace that motorist and the car that he himself was using when that happened. What about the petrol station itself? Do you think there were many people there to see him? Yes, it was a very busy evening in the petrol station, rush hour. We know that there were several other customers getting petrol, and in particular, there was one man who was in fact asked by the petrol attendant whether he could give the, the man and the boy a lift back along the Crooked Mile, and he declined because he was on his way to Chingford, which is opposite direction. We also desperately wished to find that man. Good. Now that incident was 24 hours after Barry had first disappeared. What do you think happened in those intervening 24 hours? I'm convinced that Barry was certainly alive for 24 hours after he was kidnapped in the hands of, of his abductor. Um, it's every likelihood that he was kept in that motor vehicle in the Epping Forest or South Essex or Hertfordshire area. And we want anybody who can remember seeing the unlikely of that man with the small boy and the car to come forward and speak to us. Once again, can we have your description of the man? We have a video fit. Yes, he was about 30 to 35 years old five feet ten inches tall, normal build. Um, he's described as having a, a lined face or a wrinkled complexion more than perhaps his, his years should, should show. And he's a local man, is he? Every indication from the way he spoke and the way he acted seems to show that he knew that area and he had some local knowledge of, of uh, places we've mentioned. Right. Now it's four months since Barry disappeared now. How urgent do you think it is that you find him? It's vital that we find this man. It was a brutal and callous murder of a small boy by a man who went out looking for his victim and having found him, I'm positive that he knew what he was going to do to him and how his end would be. Um, I'm absolutely certain we will catch him, not only for what he did to Barry Lewis, but because we have the very real fear that having done this once, he will set out to do it again. Mr Hatfield, let's hope that somebody can help. If you can help in any way, please do ring us at Crime Watch on 01 811 8055. Or if you prefer, you can ring Police Direct at Chingford on 01 529 866. That's 01 529 866. Last month, under the title Operation Stranger, police officially linked the murders of two children, six-year-old Barry Lewis and 14-year-old Jason Swift. We showed a reconstruction of the Barry Lewis case four months ago. Tonight, we concentrate on Jason Swift. His body was found only six miles away from Barry's at Stapleford Tawney in Essex. Both boys had been drugged. Very little is known about what Jason did or where he went during the last six months of his life. Some of the people who did see him during that time have taken part in our film to reenact what they remember. We're starting in Hackney in North London, where Jason was living with his sister, Hayley, last July. The flat where Jason stayed with his sister is boarded up now. The family has moved. Jason was brought up in Nuneaton and in East London with his three brothers and sister. When he was six, he was taken into care at a Dr Bernardo's home in Kent and lived there for four years. During that time, Jason got to know the south coast of England well. The children were often taken there on day trips. He went back to live with his mother in 1981, but left there in June last year to stay with his sister Hayley and her husband Adam at their flat in Hackney. Going down the market, Jason, do you want to come? Uh, no, I think I'll stay here. Are you sure? Yeah. You know, I'm really happy here. What are you going to be doing while I've gone? I'll just play Monopoly for a while. OK, then. See you later. Right. Bye. Bye.
Before he left, Jason stole 75 pounds in cash from his sister's bedroom. He took with him his clothes, a few books, and his Monopoly set packed in plastic carrier bags. The door was sort of open, but we thought like, nothing of it. We thought he might have gone round to the shops or something and just forgot to shut the door. About 15 minutes later, we noticed the money had gone. And then we noticed all the insides, the monopoly had gone, all the board and all the money and that had gone. That's when we realised he'd run away. That was on the 6th of July last year. The investigation into Jason's murder spans the six months up to the discovery of his body in November. Around the end of June or beginning of July, he visited a coin dealer in Charing Cross. Jason liked to collect foreign coins and had often called before, but this time he'd come to sell. Morning, Jason. Morning, if you got to buy these. Place them on the train. A group like this, I would pay about five pounds for. That's great. OK. He was a very bright lad, uh, always very polite, very single-minded about his collecting. I suspected, really, that he almost fantasised about going to the countries that the coins originated from and having small change in his pocket to be able to spend if and when he arrived there. We don't know where Jason went immediately after he disappeared, but three days later, on the 9th of July, he turned up on his own at the Silver Sands Caravan Park in Camber Sands, Sussex. Uh, Mrs Clark? Yes? The man on the gate sent me. Yeah? Can I stay in your van? How long for? Just two days. How many of you? Just me. Oh. Oh. Yeah, we'll see what we can do. Come on. Van. Nice, large van. So you're on your own then? Yeah. Don't you ever come out with your parents? No, they let me travel on my own. It's like an adventure. I'm uh, supposed to be visiting a friend in Hastings. Oh, well, that's all in the same area. You're not far from there, you know. No. I thought you would have had a friend with you to company to go about with. A friend? No, well... I had a friend stay with me once, and he stole money from me, so I don't trust anyone. He hadn't been here long when he came back with the key, and he said, I'm going for a swim. So he went for a swim, and when he came back, I suppose it could have been within the hour, I knew he'd been for a swim, cos all his hair was all wet. <laughs> and uh, then he went in, in, but I think he might have been down for fish and chips. The next day, he uh, went for a walk to Rye, he said he was going to Rye. I uh, didn't see much of him that day at all. I couldn't make out really how old he was. I thought, you know, 12, because he had two front teeth missing and he seemed such a young child. Very quiet, reserved in his way, I thought. Didn't seem to... Um, well, he wasn't a pushy boy. I rather took to him, really. <laughs> Jason made contact with his family twice at the end of July. On the 22nd of July, he sent a postcard to his mother. The card, now marked by various forensic tests, had been posted on the south coast. Dear Mum, I'm OK and not to worry. I'm working with the fair at South End, so don't worry. See you soon. I'm going to the north soon. Jason Swift. In fact, police now know Jason wasn't with the fair at South End. Around the same time, Haley's husband, Adam, received a phone call. Hello? Uh, hello, Adam. Where are you? I'm staying with a friend from school and his father. Jason, where are you ringing from? I'm in South uh, London. What's the number? I'm, I'm not saying. You coming up? Yeah, I'm thinking of coming back. I don't know when. I'll, I'll phone tomorrow night and tell you. Right then. Bye. OK then, bye. Nothing was heard or seen of Jason at all during August. Then, on the 11th of September, his mother received a birthday card from him. 
It was probably posted in either Croydon or Crawley. Dear Mum, I haven't forgot you, so don't worry about me. I'm all right. I'll come and see you in the next few months. Happy birthday from Jason. Again, the trail goes cold for the rest of September and the whole of October. Then, on the 6th of November, a girl who knew Jason thinks she saw him on a 253 bus in North London. She travelled from Manor House, but can't remember where Jason got on. When she got off at Mayor Street, Hackney, Jason was still on the bus. About three weeks after that, Jason was murdered. He'd been drugged with tranquilizers and asphyxiated. Well, Chef, Detective Chief Inspector Derek Cass, there's one very important element in this case which we haven't so far mentioned, isn't there? Yes, there is. He had very few friends of his own age, but he did associate with gay men. Uh, and we're appealing in particular for these persons in the relevant period to come forward and contact us. Are there any particular kinds of people you're appealing to in, the, in that connection? Yes, with the gay connection in mind, um, I would ask the viewers this question. Did a boy of Jason's description visit next door or a house or flat nearby in the months that we are looking to fill, especially the last three weeks in November? If he did, and perhaps he wasn't seen after the last week in November, then I would ask him to come forward, well, these people, the viewers, to come forward and contact us. Right. Now, there are a lot of gaps in that <coughs> calendar of ours. Do you think there are any other people who may have seen him, for example, maybe shopkeepers? Yes, that's right. Uh, Jason is a normal 14-year-old. He would visit shops to purchase sweets, crisps, drinks, uh, and uh, he often did this, uh, and shopkeepers persons visiting shops would probably have seen him. In addition to that, Jason had uh, a bedwetting problem. He also had mouth ulcers and he had his two front teeth missing. Uh, and in connection with that, he may have visited dentists or doctors anywhere uh, to seek consultation. Uh, and we're again asking for the, those professions and their receptionists to contact us and come forward. Right. Obviously, as you said, the last month of his life is very important to find out what he did. Do you think he could perhaps have gone back to the South Coast, which he knew well and loved? Jason had a habit of either going to places he knew or to visit persons he knew. And it's quite likely that he could have visited uh, the South Coast or, for that matter, anywhere. Now, you've linked Jason's death with the murder of Barry Lewis. What are your reasons for doing that? There are several common factors between the two deaths. Firstly, the they're both male boys. Secondly, they were both found naked. They were both positioned, uh, Jason at Stapleford Tawney and, and Barry six miles away at Waltham Abbey, both in rural Essex, both within uh, the borders of North and East London. Right. I'll just make clear again that any gay person who thinks they knew Jason during that time, between July and November, can come forward in the knowledge that it's in complete confidence and also that no action will be taken against them. Absolutely. Right. So if you do think you can help in any way, please do ring us. Our number here at Crime Watch is 01 8055. Your calls will be treated in complete confidence. Or if you don't want to speak to the police, you can talk to a BBC researcher. Or ring the police direct at Essex headquarters on 0245 267 267. That's 0245 for Chelmsford 267 267.